the North Atlantic, 1987. The greatest ocean adventure of all time is underway. Inclement weather and treacherous waters pose life-threatening risks to the crew of the French research vessel Nadir. The crew, however, will not be deterred. Each member of this expedition shares a common dream, to explore and then retrieve treasures from the most famous of all lost ships, the RMS Titanic. The deep diving submersible Nautil will travel nearly two and a half miles beneath the surface through ink black darkness and icy cold waters before it reaches its destination. At this depth, if there is a major malfunction, there will be no chance for escape. For the scientists and adventurers who have gathered for this mission, the dangers are not the topic of discussion, only the rewards. This group has come to explore a time capsule of sorts, a lost relic from an age long since past. The mission? Retrieve artifacts from the greatest ocean liner ever built so the world can again behold the treasures of the Titanic. For three quarters of a century, the most spectacular ship of its day, and quite possibly the most spectacular ship ever built, has rested comfortably on the ocean floor, hidden from sight deep in the murky depths of the North Atlantic. It would take 73 long years to solve the mystery of its location and final resting place. But after several unsuccessful attempts, the RMS Titanic was finally located in 1985 by a joint American-French team of oceanographers. A year later, American researchers explored the ship up close, and in 1987, further exploration of the Titanic was conducted. This time, retrieval of artifacts from the great ship began. And as a result, we have an opportunity to gain further understanding into one of history's great tragedies. But in order to retrieve these treasures of the Titanic, a scientific mission was mounted that was as technically sophisticated, as well-planned, and quite frankly, just as dangerous as landing a man on the moon. The 1987 mission to the site of the RMS Titanic would bridge a 75-year gap between the ages. The expedition was conducted by a joint French and American research team under the auspices of the prestigious French Oceanographic Institute, IFREMIR. The backbone of the operation was the deep diving submersible Nautil. It is one of only two such vessels in the world capable of carrying out this extraordinary assignment. The Nautil is an ultra-sophisticated $20 million submersible packed with the latest in high-tech equipment. The crew thoroughly trained and highly experienced, yet nothing had prepared them for what they found on the ocean floor. We had landed on the bottom in front of the Titanic about 100 yards and powered up the lights and all the systems, lifted the sub off the bottom in full trim started moving towards the bow of the Titanic, and it's total darkness down there. And suddenly, in the shadows, looms this just gigantic shape that keeps taking form. And then the shape and the shadows become recognizable. The mission's chief photographer, Ralph White, recalls the impact of coming upon the most sought-after wreck in the world. White was a member of the 1985 expedition that found the Titanic. You can see the anchors. You can see the third anchor on the bow. You start to pick up the detail of the change. It was, it was really an eerie feeling after all these years and all this planning and everything finally to be there and to realize that I was one of the few people that would ever get a chance to see this magnificent ship.
Prior to the dive, White and the mission commanders confer on the objectives of that day's operation. The submersible is under the direction of Commander P.H. Nargiolet, while the entire expedition is headed by Commandant Jan Karenfleck. Earlier, small sonar devices called transponders have been placed on the bottom. The signals emitted by these transponders allow the Nadir to position herself above the Titanic. The Nautil's descent to the ocean floor is slow and tedious. The 26-foot-long sub has, at its core, a titanium sphere that is only six feet in diameter. It is capable of carrying a three-person crew to a depth of 20,000 feet. Inside, the pilot sits upright while the co-pilot and observer must recline for the entire duration of the dive. The Nautil's high-tech adventure on the seafloor is really the crowning achievement to a centuries-old desire to journey into and explore this hostile and alien environment. The earliest technology developed in this area seemed tailor-made for a Jules Verne novel. Devices like this primitive diving suit and this crude 18th century one-man submersible known as a diving barrel were imaginative and occasionally effective devices that allowed the most daring to conduct underwater explorations. Today, technological advances have still not eliminated the one factor that has remained constant through the ages. That factor is the extreme danger involved in any deep ocean expedition. The hazards inherent in a 12,500 foot drop to the ocean floor are overwhelming. Being able to go to the depth of the Titanic, engineering wise is almost as uh, extensive as going to the moon in a space program. It's a totally different uh, type of engineering in space, you're dealing with an absence of pressure. In the deep ocean, you're dealing with astronomical pressures. The weight of that water on the bottom at 12,500 feet is equivalent to about 6,500 pounds per square inch. That would be almost like uh, taking two pieces of steel, putting a person's body in it, and then driving it over with the Atchison Topeka and the Santa Fe. Probably the most dangerous thing and the thing most likely to happen on a submersible dive because of the oxygen enriched atmosphere that we're in and with all the electronics being in the crew sphere would be a fire. Uh, it can only be uh, compared to the Apollo fire in the space program that killed the three astronauts. Uh, the chances of an implosion are always there. Uh, if you had a pinhole leak, it would be a pinhole for a millionth of a second or so, and then the entire sphere would implode, and literally you'd be cosmic dust. It takes the Nautil an hour and 45 minutes to descend the two and a half mile journey to the ocean floor. It is a trip through the most extreme conditions. The descent goes at about 100 feet per minute, and as you descend to approximately 300 feet, the water becomes an intense blue. From 300 feet to 1,000, you go through an intense, intense blue to a total pitch black. At about 2,000 feet, there is no light at all. It is totally pitch black. At about 3,000 feet, you start to pick up creatures which are called bioluminescence. In other words, they are marine life that actually glow. The bottom of the ocean is pitch black. The only thing you can see is whatever your lights illuminate. Uh, there are crabs, uh, some mollusk, uh, but mostly just the deep ocean rat tail, which are attracted to the lights. It's the first light these fish have ever seen in their entire lives and mesmerized by it. When the submersible first reached the bottom, it was a significant and poignant moment in maritime history. The Nautil, a triumphant success, confronted the greatest of nautical disasters. What's it like to actually dive to the Titanic? 
Well, take it from this inexperienced diver that it is an experience filled with a great deal of fear, excitement, and awe. Fear when that submarine hatch is closed and you know there's no turning back. Excitement at the mere thought of seeing something as legendary as the Titanic. And then intense awe when you finally arrive at the bottom of the ocean, two and a half miles down, and start seeing sights that you know no one else has ever seen before. It certainly is an intensely personal experience that affects everyone who has that chance to do it quite differently. But any way you look at it, no doubt about it, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. Diving on the Titanic and safely exploring the great wreck was indeed a remarkable scientific achievement. And as far as recovering artifacts from the ship, well, that was a culmination of a treasure hunter's dream. But it's important for you to realize that this quest for treasure has nothing to do with obtaining great wealth. It really is about a spirit of adventure and the bold and always perilous attempts by ocean explorers to try and solve the mysteries of the sea. As an example, in July of 1956, Italy's most luxurious liner, the Andrea Doria, was involved in a mid-sea collision with the Swedish liner Stockholm in a fog bank 280 miles off the coast of New York. Suffering a gaping 40-foot hole in her starboard side, the Andrea Doria tipped over and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic in 240 feet of water. 25 years later, the noted adventurer and diver, Peter Gimbel, and his wife, Elga Anderson, began exploring the wreck. In 1984, they mounted an expedition with the goal of retrieving the ship safe and checking out the rumors that the ship sank because a crucial watertight door was missing from the liner. Working from a diving bell, Gimbel and his fellow divers succeeded in retrieving the safe and eventually discovered that the collision with the Stockholm had ripped a massive 80-foot hole in the ship's side, flooding the generator room and thus dooming the Andrea Doria. While the recovered treasure was limited, the hazardous expedition was extremely successful. In terms of great treasure, no one comes even close to finding what longtime treasure hunter Mel Fisher located in 1986 off the Florida Keys in the Gulf of Mexico. Fisher, an Indiana chicken farmer, had spent 14 years hunting for the wrecks of two Spanish galleons, the Atocha and the Margarita, which had gone down in a hurricane in the year 1622. After having scoured hundreds of thousands of miles in his search, Fisher and his team of divers finally located the remains of the Atocha in 50 feet of water some 20 miles south of Key West. The treasure, which is spread over 18 square miles of seabed, is still being recovered. The ship's cargo included emeralds from Colombia, pearls from Venezuela, and gold and silver from Peru. The estimated value of the treasure is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Each new discovery of treasure hidden beneath the seas carries with it a measure of glory, romance, and historical significance. It seems, though, that all recent finds and explorations pale by comparison to the rediscovery of the Titanic. Not a day has passed in the 76 years since its sinking without someone somewhere speaking of the Titanic. When the Titanic was finally found, the ship itself was a unique and valuable treasure. To understand why the artifacts from the Titanic are so rare, it is first necessary to understand why the Titanic herself was so special. After all, there have been thousands and thousands of ships down through the years. But make no mistake about it, the Titanic was special. For at the time she was completed in 1912, she was the biggest, the best, and the most luxurious ship ever built. As a White Star Line's publicity brochure put it, the Titanic represents the highest attainment in naval architecture and marine engineering and stands for the preeminence of the Anglo-Saxon race in command of the seas. In order to give you some visual reference as to what we are talking about, we have come to Long Beach, California, where the only ship approaching her era still exists. This is the Queen Mary built in the early 1930s and which crossed the Atlantic a thousand and one times during her 31 years of passenger service. 
Today, the Queen Mary has been converted into a hotel and lies at permanent birth here in Southern California. She serves as a lasting monument to those great liners that sailed the oceans of the world. Now, all of them gone with this one exception. Through her, hopefully we can demonstrate what made the Titanic so truly unique. The story of the Titanic began in England shortly after the turn of the century at a dinner in this elegant London residence known as Downshire House in Belgrave Square. That evening, the decision was made to build a series of super transatlantic liners that would be larger than any other ships afloat. In terms of elegance and comfort, as well as size, they would be in a class by themselves. The first two were to be called the Olympic and Titanic. The ships would be built here at the Harland and Wolfe shipyards in Belfast, Ireland, which today is still very much in operation, and where builders have been turning out ships of every size and description for more than 125 years. The location where the Olympic and Titanic were built still exists, although there is nothing to identify the history that began here, only the rusting remains of the immense 200-foot-high gantries that once stood tall, anchored at a cement base four and a half feet deep. By 1909, those gantries, specially erected for building these ships, towered over the yards as construction was rapidly proceeding on the first ship, the Olympic. On the left was the second of these ships, the Titanic. They were so huge, previously three ships would have been under construction here instead of just two. So elaborate were the plans for the Titanic, it required a 300-page book just to list the fittings, furnishings, and decorations involved. The lengthy list of statistics is impressive. Her giant reciprocating engines were three stories high. Her rudder alone was over six stories tall and weighed 101 tons. Her 15-ton anchor required 10 horses just to pull it through the streets of Belfast. A massive workforce that eventually reached 4,000 men was assigned to the task of building the Titanic. It took them two years from the time her keel was laid until she was ready to leave the gantry. While these statistics are certainly impressive, it is still very hard to comprehend just how big the Titanic really was. But maybe this will help. I'm standing on the wing bridge, which is the highest deck level on this ship. From up here, the captain could view the entire 882-foot length of the Titanic. That's almost three football fields long. From this point down to the waterline was a distance of about 80 feet. Now, that may not sound so big, but let me tell you, from up here, that figure takes on a whole new dimension. <laughs> I mean, I would hate to have to jump. And don't forget, there was still another 30 feet of ship beneath the water. By February of 1912, the RMS Titanic was nearing completion. These rare films are the only motion pictures existing of the great liner. By April 10th, the Titanic, virtually a floating palace, was ready for her maiden voyage to New York. Edith Hazeman was just 15 when she boarded the Titanic with her parents. Now 91 and one of the few remaining survivors of the disaster, she still remembers the ship's beauty. It's a really a very beautiful ship. Uh, the uh, staircase of the first class is really beautiful. And um, the second class is as good as the first just as beautifully laid the tables were, and the most beautiful paintings were up on the wall. Then they had their swimming baths and um, gymnasium for the people and children's play place. It's really a, it was a floating palace. While the Titanic appeared to have everything on board one could possibly desire, there was, strangely enough, one item that was not in sufficient quantity. I am referring to the number of lifeboats. Amazingly, the designer's original proposal had called for 64, but since that was far in excess of the number required under the maritime laws of 1912, the builders cut that number back to 16 lifeboats under davits with an additional four thrown in for good measure. Now, davits are the steel frames which lower the lifeboats, swing them out over the side, and enable them to be lowered. There were, by the way, many of these davits from the Titanic photographed on the ocean floor. After the disaster, 
It was discovered that had there been enough lifeboats on the Titanic to hold everyone, they would have needed 63, one less than the designer had originally called for. Uh, young as I was, I knew that there was this something in the air about it because my mother was so terribly upset at the thought of going because she had this premonition of danger, but she didn't, couldn't think what it was. And we weren't booked in the Titanic anyway. We were booked in a ship called the Philadelphia. And there was a coal strike and she didn't sail. And we were transferred to the Titanic, which every th the thing, everyone thought was a wonderful piece of luck. But that's when my mother's apprehension became worse. And she said to my father, I think I know now why I'm frightened. And he said, well, what is it? She said, because this is a ship that they say is unsinkable. Uh, and he put his arm around her shoulders, and I can see this quite clearly. And he said, no, my dear, this is a ship that is unsinkable. And she said, well, that is flying in the face of God, and that's why I'm frightened. Late in the evening on April 14, 1912, the RMS Titanic, the largest moving man-made object on this planet, struck an iceberg and two and a half hours later sank beneath the icy waters of the North Atlantic. Back then, the idea of locating and diving on the Titanic would have seemed absolutely ludicrous. Nevertheless, it remained an explorer's dream for the better part of this century. By the late 1970s, science and technology had finally caught up with that dream, and then it was only a matter of time until the Titanic would be found. By the early 1980s, the first serious attempts to locate the Titanic were underway. Between 1980 and 1983, Texas entrepreneur Jack Grimm sponsored three unsuccessful expeditions. The Titanic would lie in wait until 1985, when a joint French and American team of scientists finally solved the mystery of the ship's resting place. The mission, co-directed by Jean-Louis Michel of Ifremere and Dr. Robert Ballard of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, found the Titanic about 350 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. Ballard and the Woods Hole team returned to the wreck in 1986 and explored it from a deep diving submersible. With this expedition, they were able to piece together another chapter in the Titanic story. For 74 years, there was some disagreement among Titanic survivors as to how the ship actually sank. Did it go down in one piece, or did it snap in two, as some have maintained? Ballard and his team put that controversy to rest. At 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, the ship struck an iceberg. The Titanic then came to a full stop as water filled the ship. As the bow gradually disappeared, the stern of the ship stuck straight out of the water. The stress on the hull caused the liner to break apart between the third and fourth funnels. The stern appeared to right itself, but then as it filled with rushing water, it dipped beneath the ocean, bobbed around for more than a minute, and then it too slowly disappeared from sight. As it sank to the bottom, the contents of the stern section spilled out of the ship, landing on the ocean floor, creating a massive debris field between the severed sections of the ship. The Titanic's once grand and state-of-the-art accoutrements were now strewn across this area. Certainly one of the most startling discoveries during the expedition concerned the finding of a dramatic 30-foot in diameter hole just above the waterline in the bow section of the ship. A hole possibly caused by an internal explosion. The expedition found no long slit, no sheared rivets, and no sprung plates, which would have been caused by a collision with an iceberg. The hole offers dramatic views deep inside the Titanic in an area just above a huge coal bunker. It is known that there had been a coal bunker fire smoldering on board the Titanic from the day it left Belfast. The existence of this fire raises the possibility that an explosion occurred at the time of impact with the iceberg, 
possibly caused by an accumulation of combustible gases, coal dust, or a steam explosion resulting from the ice-cold water hitting the red-hot coals in the bunker. A closer examination of the area convinced the Nautil's commander, Nargio Lay, a former ammunitions expert in the French Marines, that indeed the hole showed every evidence of having been caused by an explosion. This explosion theory is supported by a Seattle, Washington engineer named William Dybo, who related to us a story he had been told many times by his father. Well, he claimed that the Titanic, in fact, never struck an iceberg. And in fact, the, she sank as a result of an explosion that developed from a fire in a coal bunker that had been burning from prior to when the ship sailed from Southampton. Now, he was a sergeant in the Army in World War I and heard this story firsthand from a crewman on the U.S. troop ship SS Mercury. This man claimed to have been a survivor, a uh, surviving stoker of the Titanic. And over the course of the journey back to the United States, my father spent a lot of time playing cards with this man, and this man insisted that the story of the iceberg having been struck was to conceal the real cause of the disaster. And we have always speculated that this possible cover-up was for insurance purposes. This explosion theory remains just that, only a theory. It will be left to future expeditions to determine if indeed it has merit and could have helped contribute to the demise of the Titanic. The detached bow and stern sections are now separated by more than three quarters of a mile of ocean terrain. The ship's agonizing plunge beneath the surface, the forces of nature and time have had a different effect on each of the two sections. The thing I remember most about the Titanic is probably the difference between the bow section, which is classical, intact except for the damage that has been done over the years by rust and by the sea in comparison to the stern where most of the people were at the end the stern is just a, a big pile of junk it's it's hardly recognizable there really are very few distinguishing marks that even make it recognizable as a portion of a ship in fact until we went down below the stern and actually went in underneath the ship and saw one of the giant propellers we weren't really 100% sure that we were right on the stern of the ship. The investigations of both the bow and stern sections were extraordinary. The view of the fallen mast and crow's nest is still among the most disturbing sights. It's here that the lookout spotted the iceberg that led to the demise of the Titanic. The crow's nest bell, so clearly visible in this photograph, signaled the impending disaster. The bell was retrieved and is in remarkable condition. It is perhaps the most haunting reminder of the events of April 14, 1912. Constant communication with the sub is maintained by a complex assortment of electronic equipment able to transmit voice communication to the very bottom of the ocean. To enable the submersible's pilots to verify locations or to confer with technicians on the mother ship, the Nautil is equipped with a camera system able to transmit pictures to the surface. Those pictures are transmitted by a uh, hydroacoustic system, I guess. Yes. yes. Okay. Indirectly. Yes, they are coming directly from the bottom. Okay. And uh, well, as far as I can know, you can send those pictures. You get right from the bottom, directly ashore via satellite or, satellite or something yeah, like that. Yeah, sure, we can. Yeah, mm. that's incredible. That means that uh, at more or less two, uh, one or two or three seconds in time, you see exactly the same thing you can see, the pilot of the submarine can, can see. Exactly the same picture. It's great. It's great.
To enable the submersible team to recover artifacts on the ocean floor and safely return them to the surface, the Ifremere team utilizes a series of wire cages which are equipped with transponders to enable the nautil to locate the basket once it reaches the bottom. First, marker buoys are dropped into position. Next, the syntactic phone-lined baskets are put overboard and set adrift. They are allowed to free fall through the two and a half mile distance to the Titanic debris field. Once on the bottom, the basket is moved by the Nautil's articulated arm into position for receiving the artifacts. Here, the Nautil is located a telegraph from the bridge. The telegraph had become separated from its stand, but both are retrieved so they can be reunited back on board the Nadir. Ever so gently, this once key piece of equipment is placed into the retrieval basket. Once the basket is full, ballast holding it down is released by the submersible pilot, and the basket begins its rise. On the surface, the recovery team prepares for the basket's arrival guided into position by signals from the transponders. As the basket nears, frogmen move into position. Safety lines are attached, and a net is placed over the top of the basket to make sure that small items are not washed out by the swells on the surface. Finally, spring lines are attached to the basket to prevent it from crashing into anything. Weighing over 1,500 pounds, the basket could cause serious injury to crew members as well as damage the priceless recovered artifacts. The Nautil's work in the debris field was conducted over the course of 32 dives. Its two mechanical arms, manipulated from within the sub, enabled the crew to recover the smallest artifacts, the most delicately crafted treasures, as well as large and cumbersome pieces of nautical equipment. In most instances, the divers were surprised by the amazing condition of what they found. The condition of most of the artifacts that we found, uh, the silver, uh, the brass, the copper, looked like a scullery maid had just polished it. The only items that seemed to have any deterioration were those of metal or where metal had touched another substance, such as bronze, such as glass. It would stain it. The little cherub from the first class uh, staircase was actually touching uh, a bunch of rust, and it's hopefully uh, during the restoration process that that can be reversed and the little sheriff will be as it was 75 years ago.
One of the most surprising finds in the debris field was this group of over 100 egg plates, still in the same position as when they had been stacked in a crate over 76 years ago. The wooden crate, long ago eaten away by tiny organisms. The plates looked as though they could have been put there yesterday. To retrieve them, a unique suction device has been attached to the nautil's arm, enabling it to gently lift the plates individually and put them into retrieval baskets. Not one plate was damaged or broken. In Southampton, near the ancient Bar Gate, is the company that originally supplied the china and glassware to the White Star Lines. Stoneyers is still in business. Its general manager is John Fox. There is no doubt in my mind that we would have supplied all the china and glassware on board the, the Titanic. They're in remarkably good condition. They've obviously been packed in a chest or a crate of some sort, which has uh, rotted away in time. The chef would have used that for cooking, uh, for cooking egg dishes in the main, I think, or spaghetti dishes. He would have, because of the nature of the dish, he could have put that straight under the grill. This is interesting, this is a teapot. It's a rather ornate teapot, uh, as we can see from the lid there. And it's a little difficult to say exactly what that's made of, whether it's earthenware or china. If it's earthenware, it would tend to be used in one of the lower class restaurants. If it was in the first class restaurant, then it would be bone china. I'm surprised that there's no uh, marine encrustation at all, but they look as good as the day they were put on the ship. One of the most sought-after items of the expedition was this assistant purser safe in the debris field. Bulky and difficult to move, the safe presented the Nautil's pilots with an extraordinary challenge. To retrieve it, the sub-team utilized a lariat. They roped the safe and lifted it into a basket. It was certainly the heaviest item to be recovered, weighing well over 100 pounds, and it was also quite possibly one of the most valuable. It was a painstakingly slow, tedious process. When the basket reached the surface, word of its recovery had spread throughout the ship. Most of the crew gathered on board to take a look at this extraordinary find. To protect it from the atmosphere, the safe was wrapped and immediately stored in fresh water. Captain Yvonne Roark reveals the manufacturer's medallion. This is uh, the plague which was fitted on the safe well, just recovered. Uh, as you can see, it comes from Thomas Perry and Sons Limited, Belson. In the debris field adjacent to the crumpled stern section of the ship, the divers made one of many very significant discoveries. What was found was a collection of some of the most vital equipment from the Titanic stern bridge. Now, we are on the bridge of the Queen Mary to try and give you some idea of what this equipment looks like when it's in its proper perspective. For example, this is a binnacle, which simply means the stand and the housing which holds the ship's compass. Obviously, it's a very important piece of equipment. The Nautil recovered the binnacle from the Titanic stern bridge. This is known as the helm. It holds the steering wheel and the steering gear, which in turn turns the rudder. The Nautil did recover one of the steering gears from the Titanic stern bridge, and this is a telegraph. This is the device which the officers on the bridge use to communicate their commands to the engine room. They signal, and the engine room then issues a response when that action has been taken. What is particularly interesting is that of the three telegraphs recovered by the Nautil from the Titanic stern bridge, all of them were in the dead stop position, yet the engine room response indicated the ship was still going slow ahead. Now, what that means is open to a lot of conjecture, but it could indicate that there was no one left in the engine room to respond. 
While most of the stern section is now nothing more than twisted and decaying metal, it is astounding that the equipment from the stern docking bridge has survived in surprisingly good condition. These pieces are indeed the best nautical treasures retrieved from the wreck. The uh, deck light made out of solid brass. Still see the inside. Glass is a little cracked, perfect condition. This is the binnacle which held the compass on the stern of the Titanic. What we have here is the uh, stern uh, rudder indicator. We have port, starboard. This indicates where the rudder is, and this is where the ship's wheel was attached. This would be what controlled the rudder. You can see the force of the sea is sheared off this piece of metal. Also, it has sheared all the bolts that mounted it to the wing or to the stern bridge of the Titanic. But it survived in one piece. We now have the complete stern bridge. A dramatic night dive and recovery of the Nautil comes to symbolize the 1987 Titanic expedition. This dangerous outing succeeds because of the careful teamwork and special talents of the crew members assembled for the mission. The friendship and camaraderie that have developed among the French and American scientists and engineers in the course of the two-month expedition were cause enough for celebration. But there were other accomplishments well worth toasting. 36 dives to the wreck of the Titanic, each conducted safely and without major incident. And most important, over 900 significant artifacts were recovered from the ocean floor. What is there about the Titanic that gives her such charisma and mystique? That's a really good question, especially considering her short career, just five days. Nevertheless, she remains the most talked about and written about ship of all time. Even now that she has been found, there is an incessant fascination with her story and an ever-increasing demand for objects with a direct connection to the Titanic. In just the past few months, there have been two major auctions of Titanic memorabilia, one in London, the other in New York. They attracted Titanic buffs and collectors from all over the world. This one in London was staged on April 15th, the 76th anniversary of the ship's sinking. We all done at 200 for the chamber pot, 210, 220, 2.30. At 2.30, I shall sell it at 2.30. Are we all 2.40? While most items that become available at public auctions are known to collectors, this year's Titanic auction produced a number of new items not known to exist before. This included many private letters and postcards, which had long been held by family members and put up for sale for the first time this year. While postcards have become particularly hot items on the collectible market, the record belongs to this Titanic postcard, which was written on the ship and mailed before she departed Queenstown, Ireland for New York. The card, dated April 11, 1912, and bearing the Queenstown postmark, was sold at last year's Titanic auction for the world record price of 2,000 pounds, then the equivalent of $3,900. The postcard was purchased by the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, located just outside of Belfast, Northern Ireland. The card was one of the stellar attractions at the museum's recent exhibition of Titanic memorabilia, which was one of the most complete ever held anywhere. It attracted throngs of visitors fascinated with the opportunity to see anything connected with the legendary liner. The museum's maritime historian, Michael McCoffin, was not at all surprised at the exhibition's success. As you know, there's, of course, a worldwide interest in Titanic. Uh, and in Belfast, the interest is particularly strong because, of course, the ship was built here. 
The exhibit's piece de resistance was the actual shipbuilder's 30-foot model of the Titanic built by Harlan and Wolfe before construction of the ship had begun. These builders' models served as guidelines as production proceeded and were accurate to the minutest detail. This model is valued in the millions of dollars. Other museums where Titanic items are on permanent display and prime attractions are in Liverpool and here at the Maritime Museum in Southampton, England. The quest to acquire newly discovered Titanic memorabilia at these museums never ceases. And while they display maritime artifacts from hundreds of ships, items connected with the Titanic are regarded as the most valuable. Undoubtedly, the most complete collection of Titanic material for sale can be found here in Southampton at a unique ocean liner shop called Cobwebs. The store's walls and shelves are jammed with over 5,000 items from many of the great but long-gone liners, such as the Lusitania, the Mauritania, right up to the QE2. But once again, the shop's customers who span the globe are most interested in items pertaining to the Titanic. She's definitely the most fascinating ship. I mean, the films that have been made of her, the times it comes up in television or on a cinema screen or even on the radio or in books, the stories that have been written about the ship or about people that are on her or something like that, it just goes on and on. And I think it will for a long, long time to come. Cobweb's collection of White Star Line items is impressive. These are all examples of the kinds of silver bowls, china plates, chamber pots, and other things that would have been used on the Titanic. But again, few, if any of these, actually came from the ship. The easiest stuff to authenticate is paper, um, whether it's a, an invitation to the launch of the Titanic or um, a postcard posted from the ship or interior brochures or most of the stuff tends to be post-disaster, which means after April the 15th. All kinds of stuff was turned out then. That is very, very much collected. But pre-sinking stuff is getting very, very difficult. Because there's so much interest in Titanic stuff, everybody that's selling it at the moment is putting the price up, which is fair enough. But it is getting much more difficult and it is getting much more expensive. What is particularly interesting is that this fascination with Titanic memorabilia pertains to items that did not go down with the ship. Imagine the excitement if artifacts recovered from the Titanic after 75 years on the ocean floor were ever made available to private collectors. While the more than 900 items recovered from the Titanic are extraordinary treasures, there are still many rare items yet to be discovered. And one of them has a particularly interesting story. It starts at the turn of the century in London, in this building, which still houses one of the world's premier bookbinding firms, Sengorsky and Sutcliffe. For more than 87 years, skilled craftsmen here have been creating exotic and priceless bindings for rare books. In 1907, the firm began producing a series of exquisite jeweled book bindings, something that hadn't been done since the Middle Ages when such books were made for princes and popes. The book they usually made this binding for was The Story of the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam. Their editions of these gold leaf books became so famous, they practically became their trademark. In 1909, they decided to produce the most sumptuous book binding the modern world had ever seen. And again, it would be a copy of the Rubaiyat with a cover design featuring peacocks. Unfortunately, it was shipped to New York on the Titanic and still rests on the bottom of the Atlantic. Derek Allen, now the managing director of the firm, told me what made the book so special. There are some nice monochrome photographs. There are the original working drawings. But there is nothing that gives us any real idea of what it looked like, of how sumptuous it really was. And that's, that's what makes it a legend. Uh, it's uh, physically quite an impressive book. It was, it's, 16 inches by 13 inches by three or four inches thick and the binding is on a, a background of dark green leather but is covered with something like 5,000 inlays and onlays of different colored leathers and on top of that uh, 1,051 semi-precious precious stones and on top of that something like 100 square feet of gold leaf um, the effort of putting all those things together took uh, one of the finest finishers, that's the man who does the actual gold tooling, two years of solid work. 
And you can also pick out here, across the tails of the peacocks, and around the edge, and the eyes and the crests of the peacocks, where the jewels were to be placed. The uh, eyes in the tails of the peacocks were made of topazes, and their crests were turquoises, and their eyes were rubies. And each one of these grapes, I think there are sort of 250 of them around the border, was an amethyst. These inside leaves are dark brown. And this, as you can perhaps see, um, features a snake. And the odd jewel in the design, the 1051st, is an emerald in the eye of the snake. And it had ivory teeth. It is, I think, something, if we could only see it today, something that would be beyond compare. It is just a totally unique book. Somewhere here in the Titanic, the jewel-bound copy of the Rubaiyat waits to be found. Valued at a thousand pounds in 1912, today the book would be a priceless treasure. Most certainly shipped in a watertight container, most experts believe it will have survived its 76-year wait on the ocean floor. Whether it will ever be recovered, only time will tell. But it is truly one of the most extraordinary treasures of the Titanic. The Titanic expedition of 1987 recovered some 900 artifacts, each a priceless treasure brought up from some two and a half miles beneath the ocean floor. It's ironic that almost immediately after their recovery, the artifacts once again disappeared from view. Now, while many of them appeared to be in remarkably good condition, their outward appearance was somewhat deceiving. For if they were not tended to immediately, these treasures which had been talked about and sought after for so many decades, would have immediately started to crumble in the hands that held them once again. Once returned from the ocean, these artifacts were packed in freshwater containers and protected from periods of long exposure to the air. These items have, in essence, been in a saltwater bath for three quarters of a century. If the salts that permeated each piece were exposed to the hydrogen and oxygen in the air, the resulting chemical reaction would ultimately destroy the pieces. All of the artifacts recovered from the Titanic were eventually taken to the labs of EDF, Electricité de France, near Paris. At EDF, a unique preservation technique is used to restore these treasures to their former splendor. Each artifact is placed in a special solution, and then a controlled electric current is introduced to activate the chemical process. During the procedure, the salts and other potentially dangerous impurities are drawn out. Every artifact posed its own special challenge, especially an early aluminum megaphone which may have been used by the Titanic's captain to call out his final commands. It's still undergoing restoration. By returning the artifacts to nearly original condition, the most important aspect of the 1987 Titanic mission becomes apparent. A direct physical connection to the great liner has been established. Now, the potential for further study of the ship through its treasures is an exciting prospect for Titanic experts like historian Charles Sachs. I think it's significant because it gives us a, a look of things from the ship since very little has survived. And it gives us a, a, something tangible to see and hold and look at. I mean, newspaper accounts is one thing. Stories and recordings is, is another. But there's something about seeing the real objects, the real things that are from the ship. It's just like people say about the Tutankhamun uh, collection. You can look at it in books, you can read about it, but when you can see the actual exhibit, see the real items, the awe and the beauty of the items really strikes you. We know that the Titanic was filled with the best of everything available, items from Europe's most prestigious manufacturers, including the finest English bone china supplied by Royal Crown Derby exquisite silver and elegant crystal but now we have learned that the ship also carried valuable items that previously were not known to have existed this is what was so special about this expedition is that it found things on the titanic that we had never seen before some historians and authors even said in the newspapers that well we know everything about the titanic and there's no use to go down to the ship now because we know everything that's not true because what was brought up from the Titanic, we have things that we had never seen before. The particular china made for the Titanic 
was also issued for other ships by Stonier. It's this brown and turquoise china. An unusual piece in my collection, we believe, is a relish dish. They brought the exact same piece up from the Titanic. Sadly, due to the conditions down there, the enamel work is almost all gone, but the White Star Line flag is quite evident in the design. It's hard to say how much that would be worth, but since it was brought up from the Titanic, 13,000 feet down, is almost like bringing back a stone from the moon. What would someone pay for that? I would tend to think, who knows, 25, 35, 50 thousand dollars, because it's an unusual piece. It shows the wear from the ocean, and it was from the Titanic. The Titanic's artifacts would be prized possessions in any collection, but these pieces will never be made available for purchase by private collectors. Still, it's only natural that there is speculation about the worth of the treasures, especially items like the cherub from the aft staircase in the first class section. The cherub from the Titanic has to probably be a couple hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. I mean, I, it would be like the, the, a Russian Easter egg, a Fabergé egg. I mean, there's, there's a couple dozen of those. Here you have one. And it's very special, very unique, because it was first class, and it's a charming relic from that era. In a sense, the 1987 Titanic expedition has enabled us to touch the past, to study and re-examine the ship and its era. But even now, with the mission behind us, is there still more to be learned from the Titanic? The Titanic is probably one of the greatest time capsules in the world. One, it was a brand new ship when it sailed on its maiden voyage. It had not started its own self-destructive processes. It sunk in extremely deep ocean in extremely cold water. We know very little about what happens to different metals, different organic materials in the deep ocean. So the Titanic has been a 75-year capsule, a time capsule. Bringing back the items that we did from the Titanic site gives everyone in the world a chance to see the grandeur that was once this great ocean liner. Now that they've been recovered, what will become of these rare artifacts from the Titanic? Well, plans are now in the works to send them out on tour, to give the people of the world an opportunity to see them firsthand, up close. In this way, these treasures of the Titanic will serve as a lasting memorial to the more than 1,500 men, women, and children who perished in the most haunting maritime disaster of this century.